Chapter 9. <clears throat> if you are considering a life of villainy, and I certainly hope that you are not, there are a few things that appear to be necessary to every villain's success. One thing is a villainous disregard for other people, so that a villain may talk to his or her victims impolitely, ignore their pleas for mercy, and even behave violently toward them if the villain is in the mood for that sort of thing. <clears throat> Another thing villains require is a villainous imagination, so that they might spend their free time dreaming up treacherous schemes in order to further their villainous careers. Villains require a small group of villainous cohorts, <clears throat> who can be persuaded to serve the villain in a hench personal capacity. And villains need to develop a villainous laugh so that they may simultaneously celebrate their villainous deeds and frighten whatever non-villainous people happen to be nearby. A successful villain should have all of these things at his or her villainous fingertips or else give up villainy altogether and try to lead a life of decency, integrity, and kindness, which is much more challenging and noble, if not always quite as exciting. Count Olaf, of course, was an excellent villain, a phrase which here means someone particularly skilled at villainy, rather than a villain with several desirable qualities. And the Baudelaire orphans had known this soon after that terrible day at Barney Beach, when the children learned of the terrible fire that began so many of the unfortunate events in their lives. But as the Queequeg tumbled into the mouth of his dreadful octopus submarine, it seemed to the orphans that the villain had become even more villainous during his brief absence from their lives. Olaf had proven his villainous disregard for other people over and over, from his vicious murder of the children's guardians to his affinity for arson. A phrase which here means enthusiasm for burning down buildings, no matter how many people were inside. But the children realized that Olaf's disregard had become even more dreadful as the Queequeg passed through the gaping mouth and was roughly tossed from side to side in a mechanical imitation of swallowing, forcing Violet and Klaus, and Fiona too, of course, to hang on for dear life as the main hall rolled this way and that, spinning Sunny in her helmet like a watermelon in a washing machine. The Count had displayed his villainous imagination on a number of occasions, from his dastardly schemes to steal the Baudelaire fortune, to his nefarious plots to kidnap Duncan and Isadora Qu Quagmire. But the siblings gazed out of the porthole and saw that Olaf's infernal imagination had run utterly wild in decorating this terrible submarine. For the Queequeg rolled along a rumbling tunnel that was almost as dark and threatening as the Gorgonian Grotto with every inch of its metallic walls covered in eerie glowing ice. <clears throat> the Count always had an assortment of cohorts from his original theatrical troupe, many of whom were no longer with him, to some former employees of Caligari Carnival. But the orphan saw that he had lured many others to join him when the tunnel rounded a corner and the elder Baudelaire's had a brief glimpse of an enormous room full of people rowing long metal oars, activating the terrible metal arms of the octopus. <clears throat> and perhaps worst of all, when the Queequeg finally came to a shuddering stop and Violet and Klaus looked out of the porthole, they learned that the villain had clearly been rehearsing his villainous laugh until it was extra wicked and more theatrical than ever. Count Olaf was standing on a small metal platform with a triumphant grin on his face. 
dressed in a familiar suit made of slippery looking material but with a portrait of another author <clears throat> whom only a very devoted reader would recognize and when he peered through the porthole and spied the frightened children he opened his mouth and began his new villainous laugh which included new wheezes bonus snarls and an assortment of strange syllables the boldlers had never heard. Ha ha ha, hippa hippa ho, he cried. Tee he tort 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 ha cha ha ha, sniggle he ha, if I do say so myself. With a boastful gesture, he hopped off the platform, drew a long, sharp sword, and quickly traced a circle on the glass of the porthole. Violet and Klaus covered their ears as the sword shrieked its way around the window. Then, with one flick of his sword, Olaf sent the glass circle tumbling into the main hall, where it lay unbroken on the floor, and leaped through the porthole onto the large wooden table to laugh at them further. I'm splitting my sides, he cried. I'm rolling in the aisles. I'm nauseous with mirth. I'm rattling with glee. I'm seriously considering compiling a joke book from all of the hilarious things bouncing around my brain. Ha, 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 he said in a silly manner. Violet dashed forward and grabbed the helmet in which Sonny was still curled so Olaf would not kick it as he pranced triumphantly on top of the table. She could not bear to think of her sister, who was inhaling the poison of the medusoid mycelium, as Olaf wasted precious minutes performing his tiresome new laugh. Stop laughing, Count Olaf, she said. There's nothing funny about villainy. Sure there is, Olaf, crowed. Ha ha, hat rack, just think of it. I made my way down the mountain and found pieces of your toboggan scattered all over some very sharp rocks. Tee torpid sniggle. I thought you had drowned in the stricken stream and were swimming with all those coughing fishes. I was broken hearted. You weren't broken hearted, Klaus said. You've tried to destroy us plenty of times. That's why I was broken hearted, Olaf cried. I personally planned to slaughter you bodlers myself after I had your fortune, of course, and pry the sugar bowls, the sugar bowl out of your dead fingers or toes. Baden and Klaus looked at one another hurriedly and almost forgotten telling Olaf that they knew the location of the sugar bowl, even though they, of course, had no idea of its whereabouts. To cheer myself up, the villain continued, I met my associates at the Hotel Denouement, where they were cooking up a little scheme of their own, and convinced them to lend me a handful of our new recruits. The elder Baudelaire's knew that the associates were the man with the beard and no hair, and the woman with hair but no beard. Two people so sinister that even Olaf seemed to find them a bit frightening. And that the new recruits were a group of snow scouts that these villains had recently kidnapped. Tee hee turncoat, thanks to their generosity. I was able to get the submarine working again. Of course I need to be back at the hotel denouement before Thursday, but in the meantime I had a few days to kill. So I thought I'd kill some of my old enemies. So I began roaming around the sea looking for Captain Wittershins and his idiotic submarine on my sonar detector. But now that I've captured the Queequeg, I find you both there's bored. It's hilarious. It's humorous. It's droll. It's relatively amusing. How dare you capture the submarine? Fiona cried. I'm the captain of the Queequeg, and I demand that you return us to the sea at once. I. Count Olaf peered down at the mycologist. I, he repeated, you must be Fiona, that little fungus freak. Why, you're all grown up. The last time I saw you, I was trying to throw thumbtacks 
into your cradle. What happened to Wittershins? Why isn't why isn't he the captain? My stepfather is not around at the moment, Fiona replied, blinking behind her triangular glasses. Tee Terry Cloth, Count Olaf said. Your stepfather has abandoned you, eh? Well, I suppose it was only a matter of time. Your whole family could never choose which side of the schism was theirs. Your brother used to be a goody-goody as well, trying to prevent fires instead of encouraging them. But eventually, my stepfather has not abandoned me, Fiona said, though her voice faltered a bit. The phrase which here means sounded as if she weren't so sure. She did not even add an I to her sentence. We'll see about that, Olaf said, grinning wickedly. I'm going to lock all of you in the brig, which is the official seafaring term for jail. We know what the brig is, Klaus said. Then you know it's not a very pleasant place, the villain said. The previous owner used it to hold traitors captive, and I see no reason to break with tradition. We're not traitors, and we're not leaving the Queequeg, Violet said, and held up the diving helmet. Sunny tried to say something, but the growing fungus made her cough instead, and Olaf frowned at the coughing helmet. What's that? he demanded. Sunny is in here, she said, and she's very ill. I was wondering where the baby brat was, Count Olaf said. I was hoping she was trapped underneath my shoe. But I see that it's just some ridiculous book. He lifted his slippery foot to reveal Mushroom Minutia, the book Fiona had been using for her research, and kicked it off the table where it skittered into a far corner. There is a very deadly poison inside that helmet, <coughs> Fiona said, staring at the book in frustration. Aye, if Sunny doesn't receive an antidote within the hour, she will perish. What do I care? Olaf growled, once again showing his villainous disregard for other people. I only need one Baudelaire to get my hands on the fortune. Now come with me. (coughs) Ha ha, handiwork. We're staying right here, Klaus said. (coughs) Our sister's life depends on it. Count Olaf drew his sword again and traced a sinister shape in the air. I'll tell you what your lives depend on, he said. Your lives depend on me. If I wanted, I could drown you in the sea. Or have you strangled by the arms of the mechanical octopus? It's only out of the kindness of my heart and because of my own greed that I'm locking you in the brig instead. Sunny coughed inside her helmet and Violet thought quickly. If you let us help our sister, she said, we'll tell you where the sugar bowl is. Count Olaf's eyes narrowed, and he gave the children a wide, toothy grin the two Baudelaire's remembered from so many of their troubled times. His eyes shone brightly, as if he were telling a joke as nasty as his unbrushed teeth. You can't try that trick again, he sneered. I'm not going to bargain with an orphan, no matter how pretty she may be. Once you get to the brig, you'll reveal where the sugar bowl is. Once my henchman gets his hands on you, or should I say hooks, tee torture? Count Olaf leaped back through the porthole as Violet and Klaus looked at one another in fear. They knew Count Olaf was referring to the hook-handed man 
who had been working with the villain as long as they had known him and was one of their least favorite of Olaf's comrades. I could race up the rope ladder, Violet murmured to the others, and fire up the engines of the Queequeg. We can't take the submarine underwater with the window gone, Fiona said. We'd drown. Klaus put his ear to the diving helmet and heard his sister whimper and then cough. But how can we save Sunny, he asked. Time is running out. Fiona eyed the far corner of the room. I'll take that book with me, she said, and hurry up, Count Olaf cried. I can't stand around all day. I have plenty of people to boss around. Aye, Fiona said, as Violet, still holding Sunny, led Klaus through the porthole to join Count Olaf on the platform. I'll be there in a second, she said, and the mycologist took one hesitant step toward Mushroom Minutia. You'll be there now, Olaf growled and shook his sword at her. He who hesitates is lost. At the mention of the captain's personal philosophy, Fiona sighed and stopped her furtive journey, a phrase which here means sneaking toward the mycological, mycological book. Or she, she said quietly, and stepped through the portal to join the Baudelaire's. On the way to the brig, I'll give you the grand tour, Olaf announced, leading the way out of the round metal room that was serving as a sort of brig for the Queequeg itself. There were several inches of water on the floor to help the captured submarine move through the tunnel, and the Baudelaire's boots made loud wet splashes as they followed the boasting villain. While Sunny coughed again in her helmet, Olaf pressed an eye on the wall, and a small door slid open with a sinister whisper to reveal a corridor. This submarine is one of the greatest things I've ever stolen, he bragged. It has everything I'll need to defeat VFD once and for all. It has a sonar system, so I can rid the seas of VFD submarines. It has an enormous fly swatter, so I can rid the skies of VFD planes. It has a lifetime supply of matches, so I can rid the world of VFD headquarters. It has several cases of wine that I plan to drink up myself and a closet full of very stylish outfits for my girlfriend. And best of all, it has plenty of opportunities for children to do hard labor. Gesturing with his sword, he led the children around a corner into an enormous room, the room they'd had a glimpse of as the Queequeg tumbled inside this terrible place. It was quite dark, with only a few lanterns hanging from the tops of tall pillars scattered around the room, but Violet and Klaus could see two large rows of uncomfortable-looking wooden benches on which sat a crowd of children hurriedly working long oars that stretched across the room and even beyond the walls where they slid through metal holes in order to control the tentacles of the octopus. The elder Baudelaire's recognized some of the children from a troop of snow scouts they had encountered in the Mortmain Mountains. And a few looked quite a bit like other students at Perfrock Preparatory School, where the siblings had first encountered Carmelita Spatz. But some of the others were children with whom the Baudelaire's had had no prior experience, a phrase which here means who had probably been kidnapped by Count Olaf or his associates on another occasion. The children looked very weary, quite hungry, and more than a little bored as they worked the metal oars back and forth. In the very center of the room appeared to be another octopus, this one made of slippery cloth. Six of the octopus's arms hung limply at its sides, but two of them were waving high in the air one of them clutching what looked to be a long, damp noodle. Row faster, you stupid brats, the octopus cried in a familiar, wicked voice. 
We have to get back to the hotel denouement before Thursday. And it's Monday already. If you don't hurry up, I'm going to hit you with this tagliatelle grande. I warn you, being struck with a large piece of pasta is an unpleasant and somewhat sticky experience. Ho, ho, sniggle. He, he, snaggle, Olaf cried in agreement, and the octopus whirled around. Darling, it cried, and the siblings were not surprised to see that it was Esme Squalor, Count Olaf's treacherous girlfriend, in another one of her absurd stylish outfits. Using the slippery cloth of the submarine's uniforms, the villainous girlfriend had fashioned an octopus dress with two large plastic eyes, six extra sleeves, and suction cups stuck all over her boots, just as real octopi have them on their tentacles to help them move around. Esme took a few sticky steps toward Olaf and then peered at the children beneath the slippery hood of the dress. Are these the Baudelaire? she asked in astonishment. How can that be? We already celebrated their deaths. It turns out they survived. Count Olaf said, but their good luck is about to come to an end. I'm taking them to the brig. The baby certainly has grown, Esme said, peering at Fiona, but she's just as ugly as she ever was. No, no, Olaf said. The baby's locked up in that helmet, coughing her little lungs out. This is Fiona, Captain Widdershin's stepdaughter. The captain abandoned her. Abandoned her? Esme repeated, how in, how stylish, how marvelous. This calls for more of our new laughter. Ha ha hedgehog. Tee hee tempe, Olaf cackled. Life keeps getting better and better. Esme shrieked, our triumph is just around the corner. Olaf crowed, VFD will be reduced to ashes forever. Esme cried, we are going to be painfully wealthy. Olaf shouted, the world will always remember the name of this wonderful submarine. What is the name of this submarine? Fiona asked. And to the children's relief, the villains stopped their irritating laughter. Olaf glared at the mycologists and then looked at the ground. The Carmelita, he admitted quietly. I wanted to call it the Olaf, but somebody made me change it. The Olaf is a cake-sniffing name, cried a rude voice the siblings had hoped never to hear again. And I'm sorry to say that Carmelita Spatz skipped into the room, sneering at the Baudelaire's as she did so. Carmelita has always been the sort of unpleasant person who believed that she was prettier and smarter than everybody else. And Violet and Klaus saw instantly that she had become even more spoiled under the care of Olaf and Esme. She was dressed in an outfit, perhaps even more absurd than Esme Squalor's, in different shades of pink, so blinding that Violet and Klaus had to squint in order to look at her. Around her waist was a wide frilly tutu, which is a skirt used during ballet performances. And on her head was an enormous pink crown, decorated with light pink ribbons and dark pink flowers. She had two pink wings taped to her back, two pink hearts drawn on her cheeks, and two different pink shoes on each foot that made unpleasant slapping sounds as she walked. Around her neck was a stethoscope, such as doctors use, with pink puffballs pasted all over it. And in one hand, she had a long pink wand with a bright pink star at the end of it. Stop looking at my outfit, she commanded the Baudelaire scornfully. You're just jealous of me because I'm a tap-dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian. You look adorable, darling, purred Esme, patting her on the crown. Doesn't she look adorable, Olaf? I suppose so, Count Olaf muttered. I wish you would ask me before taking disguises from my trunk. But, Countie, I needed your disguises, Carmelita whined. 
batting her eyelashes, which were covered in pink glitter. I needed a special outfit for my special tap dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian dance recital. Several of the children groaned at their oars. Please no, cried one of the snow scouts. Her dance recitals last for hours. Have mercy on us, cried another child. Carmelita Spatz is the most talented dancer in the entire universe, Esme growled, snapping the noodle over the rowers' heads. You, Brett, should be grateful that she is performing for you. It'll help you row. Ugh, Sunny could not help saying from inside her helmet as if the idea of Carmelita's dance recital were making her even sicker. The elder Baudelaire's looked at one another and tried to imagine how they could help their young sibling. I think we have a pink cape aboard the Queequeg, Klaus said hurriedly. It would look perfect on Carmelita. I'll just run back to the submarine and... I don't want your old clothes, you cake sniffer, Carmelita said scornfully. A tap dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian doesn't wear hand-me-downs. Isn't she precious, Esme cooed. She's like the adopted child I never had, except for you Baudelaire's, of course, but I never liked you much. Are you going to stay and watch me, County? Carmelita asked. This is going to be the most special dance recital in the whole wide world. There's too much work to do, Count Olaf said hastily. I have to throw these children in the brig so my associate can force them to reveal the location of the sugar bowl. You like that sugar bowl more than me, Carmelita pouted. Of course we don't, darling, Esme said. Olaf, tell her that sugar bowl doesn't mean a thing to you. Tell her she's like a wonderful marshmallow in the middle of our lives. You're a marshmallow, Carmelita, Olaf said, and pushed the children out of the enormous room. I'll see you later. Tell Hokey to be extra vicious with those brats, Esme cried, whipping the Tagliatelle Grande over her fake octopus head. And now on with the show. Count Olaf ushered the children out of the room as Carmelita Spatz began tapping and twirling in front of the rowers. The elder Baudelaire's were almost grateful to go to the brig rather than being forced to watch a tap-dancing ballerina fairy princess veterinarian dance recital. Olaf dragged them down another hallway that twisted every which way, curving to the right and to the left, as if it were a snake the mechanical octopus had eaten and finally stopped in front of a small door with a metal eye where the doorknob ought to have been. This is the brig, Count Olaf cried. Ha ha ha, Ashtree. Sunny coughed once more from inside her helmet, a rough, loud cough that sounded worse than before. <clears throat> the medusoid mycelium was clearly continuing its ghastly growth, and Violet tried one more time to convince the villain to let them help her. Please let us go back to the queek quag, she said. Can't you hear her coughing? Yes, Count Olaf said, but I don't care. Please, Klaus cried. This is a matter of life and death. It certainly is, Olaf sneered, turning the knob. My associate will make you reveal the location of the sugar bowl if he has to tear you apart to do it. Listen to my friends, Fiona said. I were in a terrible situation. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Count Olaf said, with a wicked smile, as the door creaked open to reveal a small, bare room. There was nothing in it but a small stool, at which a man sat, shuffling a deck of, shuffling a deck of cards, with quite a bit of difficulty. How can a family reunion be a terrible situation, Olaf said and shoved the children inside the room, slamming the door behind them. Violet and Klaus faced Olaf's associate and turned the diving helmet so Sonny could face him too. The siblings were not surprised, of course, that the person shuffling the cards was the hook-handed man, and they were not at all happy to see him, 
and they were quite scared that their time in the brig would make it impossible to save Sunny from the mushrooms growing inside her helmet. But when they looked at Fiona, they saw that the mycologist was quite surprised at who she saw in the brig and quite happy to see the man who stood up from his stool and waved his hooks in amazement. Fiona, the hook-handed man cried. Fernald, Fiona said, and it seemed they just might save Sunny after all.